is, hi, I'm, I'm Chris Lorenzo. I think I introduced myself in, in a few slides. Um, we are going to talk about progressive web apps. Come on in. There's lots of seats in the front. I will try not to spit when I talk. At least I, I cover up pretty well in the front. I don't pontificate or whatever, whatever it is. Um, so we're going to go through why performance is important. We're going to talk a little bit about progressive web apps. How many people were in Kyle's talk this morning about progressive web apps? So everybody has like a deep dive of what they are. We don't cover that for that long. It's like five minutes. So you don't have to worry about the overlap. We're going to talk about measuring performance, cost of JavaScript, uh, single page app architectures, and then we're going to go into some optimization examples of how to actually make your site fast. These slides are available. I will also tweet them out at the end. My Twitter handle is at ChiefCLL. That's my nickname, Chief. If you have any questions, you can ask my son, Theo. You can just raise your hand or press the air horn at any time. If you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. So I am married. Uh, I've been married for seven years. The slides are a little dark. My wife's really cute. I've been at Comcast for 11 years. Uh, I've been doing front-end development for over 15 years now. And I like to say that I believe in long-term relationships, which is odd for a front-end developer because we have new frameworks every other week. That is my one and only joke that I have for this entire talk. Uh, my kids are really adorable, which they're a little dark there, but Josie is, is awesome. I work at Comcast. How many people know of Comcast? Okay, they need no introduction at all, um, but they are one of the largest cable TV internet providers in the United States. And I live in the United States, so I'm from Philadelphia. And like I said, I, I took a plane ride over here. Philadelphia is, I like Philadelphia a lot better than Chicago. There was like no, there was, there was a lot of traffic getting from the airport into the city at 9.30 this morning, which is like, that doesn't happen in Philadelphia. Um, there's tons of traffic from 7 a.m. to like 9-ish, but after that, it's, it's relatively not bad. Much better city, doesn't get negative 50. Feel free to move out to Philadelphia when you're done your, your college education here. Um, and we work on a lot of different things. So this is our MyXFinity portal. Gets about a million unique visitors a day. It's uh, Ruby on Rails back end, just some jQuery on the front end, no real front end framework or technology. Uh, then we have my account. This is written in Angular 1.5. Uh, so this is where customers go to pay their bill, manage their account. Xfinity Home. This is written in Google Polymer. I was actually a part of the team, led the team who did this. Uh, so this is my house. We have home security, uh, video cameras, home automation. So I can actually, I like to say I turn on and off all the lights in my house to get my wife's attention when she's busy changing diapers on the kids and she gets angry at me when I do that. That's my second joke, I guess. Kind of. um, lastly, we have Xfinity X5. We're going to talk about this one a lot. This is written in Google Polymer as well, single page app. Um, and this allows customers to control their gateway settings. So anybody who's on their network, they can see all the devices on their network. They can pause the devices. They can shut off the internet. They can do parental controls. They can set bedtime routines. It's great. It's free for Comcast customers who have a gateway router. And last but not least, the X1 platform. The best video viewing experience ever. I'm partially biased, but in my unbiased opinion, I still think it's the best. Uh, we just we have Netflix integration and Amazon integration. Uh, so and, and Netflix now has like the whole go through the thing and select your episodes. So pretty cool. I love it. Um, the website's also written in Google Polymer as well, single page app. So that's the background. We're going to get started. Why does speed matter? This is my daughter playing with some $100 bills. Uh, this was not set up or anything. We just had some $100 bills lying around because everybody should just have $100 bills lying around. And she grabbed them off the table, and I was like, I'll take a picture of her because uh, that's cute, and I can use it in my, my, my slides. Um, so I've been doing web development for a long time, and back in 2012, I was, I was still at Comcast. And I was working on this site called Xfinity TV. We were actually the first team to bring video online, premium video online. So stuff that actually required subscriptions like HBO, Showtime, Cinemax, Stars. Um, and life was like so simple back then, right? You, you wrote a web page and your browser would go to the site, it would render, and then we would return some HTML, CSS, and a little teeny tiny bit of JavaScript and that was your page. And then you would click on a link and then it would go to a whole new page and just render and it wasn't as complicated as the single page apps that we have today. Also, bandwidth. Like, over the last five or six years, um, we, we, uh, we were at like five megabits. And now we take it for granted that we're 
I have a 250 meg connection at my house. Um, we're at over gigabit connection speeds now. How many people have, how many people remember dial-up? This is, this is kind of, okay, wow, no, you do not remember dial-up. This is all like young college students here who are like, you know what dial-up is, you don't know what dial-up is. 288K, like you would play Doom over dial-up and you would just be like jumping through walls. It was fun. Um, also desktop performance. So I'm, I'm trying to go into the history of performance and how, how great technology is today. Uh, so I have I have an Apple MacBook. Uh, I love watching video online, and you can actually watch Netflix on your laptop. And if you ever look at your CPU usage, it's at like five percent while watching 1080p, and that's really amazing because all of the decoding of video is now being done in your CPU uh, or in your GPU even. So it's all offloaded. Uses very low battery. It's just incredible. And, and the biggest thing that's happened since for web development is the release of Chrome in 2008. Uh, and I remember when this first came out, like Google was like, oh yeah, we got this new web browser and it's twice as fast as Internet Explorer. And I was like, oh, cool, let's, let's download this and check it out. And every, every six months from that time that it was released, it was like, and now we're twice as fast as we were, twice as fast and twice as fast ago. And like the V8 engine today is just like incredibly fast. And really, so as, as web developers, we got really lazy, right? We could sit back and even our Nintendo Entertainment Systems were getting smaller. Uh, it, di it didn't matter what we were shipping down to the browser because everything else was so fast. And so in 2016, this article came out where the average web page is now the original size of Doom, which is about 2.4 megabytes. Um, it's quite large. And the problem with this is that the internet now is for mobile phones. More folks are visiting your websites on mobile phones than ever before. And mobile phones are inherently slow. So anybody know of Alex Russell? This guy's great, he's from Google. He just rants all the time about how poor the performance is on mobile phones. And the biggest reason why mobile phones are slow is because they run on a battery. They have a limited amount of energy. My laptop is plugged in right now. Um, it has a very large battery compared to your phone. Uh, but phones require a lot of energy, especially to do networking. So 3G and 4G networks are inherently slow because they require battery power. Every time you connect to the internet, it has to send a signal to the tower to say, hey, I want access to it. And then it sends whatever data it wants, and then it shuts off to conserve as much power as possible. Um, I remember when like iPhones first came out, you'd have like a couple hours of power, and that was like really great. And today, I now have like the iPhone X and I go the entire day and I'm, I'm like at 80% power still. It's really incredible, um, but battery is definitely the limiting factor of why phones are slow. Uh, the other problem with like 3G and 4G networks is there's a lot of latency because your phone is actually sending network signals to a tower and it has to ask for permission to say, hey, I'd like to send information now, do I have permission to start? Um, and so, Compared to cable, so here's 3G, your average latency is 120 milliseconds versus 60 milliseconds. And again, latency is the time from your phone sending a packet to the destination receiving it. So this is how long it takes for you to connect to a website. If you're on a desktop browser with like a cable internet speed, you have about one millisecond of latency. How many people play video games here? How many people have experienced latency in video games? You know what that's like, right? Like when you shoot somebody and then it's like, they dodged my bullet. And it's like, how did they dodge? That's because you have like probably 50 or 60 milliseconds of latency. That's how they dodge your bullets. It's bullet time, it's like the matrix. Um, but it, it's great because we, we have benefits that 3G to 4G has cut the, the latency in half. So we got down to about 60 milliseconds. 5G is starting to be like rolled out or hyped up. Uh, it'll probably be like another two or three years before it's fully deployed. But that actually gets the latency down to, they say, one millisecond. It'll probably be like 10 milliseconds, but it will be a noticeably faster than what we have today. Um, but still, it's slow. iOS performance has gotten a lot better over the years. Uh, I remember a couple years ago at the Apple keynote, they were bragging about the processors in the phones are as fast as like the desktop processors of the model two years ago. And while that statement is true, your phone still runs on a battery. Um, so what happens is your the cores in your phone, you have like four, maybe even eight cores in your phone. The big one only runs for a split second. 
to get things started, and then it passes things off to the slower cores that are more energy efficient. It's all about saving battery on phones. And this causes a lot of big problems because on mobile phones, there is an incredible need for speed. Uh, so this is research that DoubleClick put out a few years ago, uh, and this is DoubleClick's owned by Google. And they said that 53% of users abandon a site that takes longer than three seconds to load. I ride the train to work all the time. I, I was actually in here on LTE because I didn't have the Wi-Fi password yet, and I was loading a site, and I'm like, nothing was happening, and you're just like, I'm done, I'm done, I'm not, I'm not going to it. Uh, and then there's another corollary to this, which is mobile pages that are one second faster experience up to 27% increase in conversion rate. If you have a site that sells stuff, you will make more money if your site is faster. I'm, I keep looking out here, I'm like, kids today, you know, like it's like college, university kind of thing. We, we don't have patience anymore. Right? We want like instant gratification. We want to go to a website. We want to click on things. And we want things to load. Uh, and again, this is a major problem on mobile phones because they are much, much slower than desktop browsers. Uh, lastly, why you want your site to be really fast is because of this tweet. None of this actually matters. It's the, it's the little line down the bottom which says speed is now a landing page factor for Google search and ads. So your search results are dependent on how fast your websites load. So I would argue that performance is your number one feature. So when you're building your site, you obviously want it to work and do what it's supposed to do. And then number two, you want it to be really, really fast. Because if it's not fast, nobody's gonna wanna use it. Um, but it's more than that, right? So why is speed important to me? I'm a web developer and I helped lead the team that built the x website. It's a beautiful single page app. Again, it's made to control the gateway routers that we offer to our customers so they can manage their internet. It is a progressive website. Um, it's a single page app, responsive website. So responsive means it fits on your mobile phone and on your desktop. And it weighs in at less than one megabyte. And again, I work at Comcast, which is a really, really large company. And for some reason, every product owner and manager says, well, we also want native apps, right? Because native apps are cool. Everybody wants a native app. And so we also built a native app, and our native app for this is 75 megabytes. It's much larger. Uh, true story, so if you were to do a self-install kit for our gateway router, we send you the gateway router, and we say you need to download this app in order to initialize the gateway router. So you have no internet, you have to go online, download the 75 megabyte app, wait about 10 minutes for your LTE to download it, so you can install it. We can do the same thing on the web, and have it up and loading in five seconds. I argued for it for a month, but it didn't go anywhere. Um, so I, I really struggle with this question of like, when should you build a native app versus just a website? And there's this great article by Owen where he talks about the trade-offs between native and web. And really to summarize this, he says, conventional websites let you reach users and native apps let you deeply engage users. So, Folks are gonna find what you have to offer via Google search. They're gonna to go to your website first, and then as they start to use your site, they like your site, you can offer them to upgrade to a native experience. Because the truth is, the web is never gonna be as fast as a native app. You can't outrun the bear. Bears run 60 kilometers per hour, and they, they, they are really fast. Native apps are always going to be faster than web apps, because they run native code versus interpreted JavaScript code. And so this really depressed me. And so I climbed up a mountain and I sat there and I stared out into the vast emptiness and I said, well, if we're never gonna be as fast as native apps, what is our goal as web developers? What are we trying to accomplish? And so our benchmarks are to have a site that is interactive in five seconds uh, and repeat loads in two seconds. So this is user clicks to go to your website. You need that thing to be visible to them in five seconds. So here's, here's what that means, time to interactive. Uh, a lot of folks know about server-side rendering, where you have the page render, and this is showing server-side rendering. So it's got something instantly to the user, but all the JavaScript is loading behind the scenes. And so the user can't actually interact with it because all the JavaScript is still processing and, and you basically just have this blank screen or a screen that the user can't do anything with. And that's a really frustrating experience. So we have to understand that loading a web page is a journey. You start off with a blank page, which Google is trying to fix right now. Um, 
And then as soon as it hits your HTML page, it will parse and render something. So that's your first contentful paint. And then it will render once it gets everything from the DOM down. And then time to interact is everything, your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is in process. You have your event listeners up, and users can actually use your site. And we want that to happen in five seconds. And that is, that is, that is really, really hard. If you want that to happen, you get 130 to 170 kilobytes of critical tap. That is the total amount of stuff that you are allowed to send down the browser on a mobile phone to get it to render in five seconds. I'm, I'm seeing all the faces out there, you're probably like, wait a minute, I'm at like 400 or 500 kilobytes for my, my asset bundle size, which is probably true. We're, we're definitely over 500 kilobytes or so. Um, but there's, there's more than just speed, right? We also want to feel more like a native app. Like the web is evolving to where we want to have the same experience that native apps have. And that's where progressive web apps come in. So I, I like to joke like that's a native app and that's the progressive web app and they're sitting close together. It's like camping theme related. All right. Uh, so Airhorner, if anybody downloaded that, that is a progressive web app. Uh, and you can see that you actually get an icon on your desktop. It can launch full screen. It works completely offline. It's like the best thing ever. Uh, and that's that's really what progressive web apps offer is this add to home screen ability. Add to home screen only works on Android devices. Uh, so if you meet all the requirements for progressive web app, you would get like a nice little button that says, hey, do you want to install this to your desktop? These are all links too. So when you get the slides, you can actually go to all the documentation for these things. You can do push notifications, which is one of the things that the web could not do for a long time. And that was like, every product owner wants to do push notifications. That's their main reason for having a native app. And I'm like, we can do push notifications on the web. We don't need that anymore. Uh, service workers. Service workers are a really incredible idea, um, but they are a bear to work with. Okay, cool. Uh, I was just dramatic pause waiting for a few giggles. Um, so some of the hardest problems in computer science are caching things and bears and naming things or something like that. Um, but service workers are another layer of cache. And cache is like really difficult to handle. So what they did was when your page makes a network request, it goes to the service worker first. Uh, then it hits like cache and then it goes to network. Like they basically add another layer of caching instructions that you can process with JavaScript, which adds a whole tremendous amount of complexity. Uh, and if you don't do it right, which we didn't do it right. Um, we, we use the SW Workbox, which is a plugin that generates a service worker for you by default. Uh, and if you don't monitor it and make sure that you're doing the right thing, it will default to downloading all the files that are available on your website, including the unminified stuff. So users were coming to our site and then downloading like 75 megabytes of content and they had no reason for it. It's awful. Service workers are fire, forest fire waiting to happen. So you've been warned. Um, but they have a benefit, which is they enable you to have granular control over caching, which allows it so that when users come to your site for the second time, that can happen in under two seconds. And so really, the rest of our talk, we're going to focus on how do we get interactive in less than five seconds? Because uh, I think that's really the challenge today with um, web development. And the first thing we have to know is the tools that are available to us as web developers. How many people have used the Google Chrome developer tools before? All right, everybody. Anybody use Firefox? Okay, <laughs> Firefox is not bad. Actually, actually, I think faster now than Chrome. Yeah, it, it, it's coming back. So there was a time when Firefox was the greatest because it had the only developer tools, and then Chrome took over. Firefox is a, a competitor now. Um, but there are a lot of great tools, regardless of what browser you use, except for Safari. I mean, so don't use Safari for web development for bugging purposes. The first thing that you want to do is you want to measure performance. You got to know what your site is currently doing because you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And the way that you measure the performance of your site is use the user timing API. Uh, and we have a, a library that Comcast open source called Surf and Perf. It's written by my coworker. He's actually a surfer. Uh, so it's legit that we can call it Surf and Perf. I couldn't call it that. I'm not a surfer. He's cooler than I am. Uh, but unfortunately, you couldn't be here today. So you got me instead. Um, so one of the things that you can do in the performance tools, you click on the, you open the developer tools, click performance, do a performance recording, and this is what you get. 
we're going to talk about what all this means a little bit later on. Um, but this gives you a snapshot of like how long it took for your site to load. The other thing you do when you do performance recordings, you want to use incognito mode um, because if you have any extensions loaded in your browser, they actually take up processing time too. And they inject JavaScript and they will affect your results. So the user timing API is actually part of the performance tools. So there's this whole section here that you can open up. Uh, and it puts measurement marks into your site. So here we have when a user first clicked on our site to the time when we put a mark for app ready, that took 3.76 seconds. So very accurate, gives us an exact number, and then we send it to our logging infrastructure. So we know exactly how long certain devices take to get to certain parts of our site. And, and you can have it for anything that you want in there. So we have another one for um, when the splash is dismissed. And I like saying that really fast, splash or smish. It's, it's a fun thing to say. Uh, the important thing to note is when you are measuring things and you're logging things, make sure that it's accurate. So we were, we were logging that the splash dismissed was happening at 2.56 seconds. But the performance tools actually take screenshots of your site and what it looks like at certain times. And it wasn't until like after 3.1 seconds before the splash was actually dismissed. And the reason for this is when you write JavaScript, JavaScript is single threaded and it queues things. So you could have code that would remove a class from your splash to make it hide. Um, and the browser will say, cool, I'm going to do that. And then it will keep processing JavaScript. And then it will eventually get to the next render cycle. And that render cycle could be 200 milliseconds later, it could be half a second later. So what you want to do is you want to change your CSS, and then you want to say, on the next animation frame, set the marks to say it's dismissed. Everybody, everybody's kosher with that? Like, yeah, that makes sense. Ooh, I like it. Um, other things that you could do, if you are just measuring JavaScript, you can use console.time and console.timeIn. So you can put that at the beginning of a function, at the end of a function, and it will tell you exactly how long that function took for it to run. All right. So, this is XFi. We, uh, there's another great tool in there called Audits tab. If you know nothing about performance, or if you're just getting started with performance, you go to that tab, you run a performance audit, and then there will be like 100 things down here with links that you can click on and get more information about how to speed up your site. Just read all of those things, and you will be an expert at some point. Uh, you'll probably never be an expert. I'm not even an expert. It's really hard. But definitely read through that. Lighthouse also has a standalone tool that can run in your continuous integration environment. Uh, it runs headlessly in Chrome. So you can actually have it every time you do a build and you're deploying. You can have it run headlessly in Node, store the results, and you can see what's happening to the performance of your site over time with every deployment, which is very valuable. So now that we know about measuring performance, we've got to talk about what affects startup performance. And luckily, Adi Asmani has written a lot of articles on this. Everybody knows Adi Asmani. He is like one of the core authors of Google Chrome. And he wrote a series of articles called JavaScript Startup Performance. And then he wrote The Cost of JS. And then he wrote a follow-up article called The Cost of JavaScript. Uh, remember I said naming things is really hard. So big summary of these three articles. And this is in his words, less code equals less parse compile, less to transfer, and less to decompress. How to make your site fast? Do it with less JavaScript. Like that's not very helpful. It's like I have certain things to do. Just try to do it with half the amount of code that you're, you're doing it now. And that's how you make your site faster. Thank you for coming. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but he talks about like what happens when your JavaScript is sent down from the browser. And they first have to download it off the network. They decompress it. They parse it. They convert it into an abstract syntax tree. They convert it to bytecode. The bytecode is optimized further, depending on which functions are being called over and over again. And then it actually runs on your CPU. And this, this takes a lot of time. So it has this great chart here. This is how long it takes for a mobile device to parse the JavaScript on CNN.com. And an iPhone 8 does it in four seconds. But if you compare that to the Moto G4, which is the baseline phone, that took 13 seconds. So it's nine seconds longer than the other one. Even an iPhone 6, which is only like two years older than an iPhone 8, took eight seconds. So double the time. And most users do not have the latest and greatest iPhone. Um, iPhone sales are dropping because they're getting more and more expensive. Most people have their phone for two or three years now. Uh, so performance is definitely an issue. But the great part is like 
the Chrome team is not standing still. They, they released this article, um, I think it was March of last year, where they are improving the parse time. So they actually created another thread to parse JavaScript behind the scenes, uh, speeding up parsing time by like 30%, which is incredible. Yeah, there is a reduction around 20 to 40% in parse comp compilation time in most web pages. So Chrome is getting faster, mobile devices are getting faster, but it still doesn't change the fact that as web developers, we need to pack less. We need to send less code down to the browser. And it starts with your framework. This is where we get into uh, framework wars and really get into heated discussions about which framework's the best. Uh, so this is uh, Xfinity Mobile. Shameless plug, uh, Comcast sells mobile phone service. I highly recommend that you check it out. It runs off of Verizon network. Uh, you pay $12 a gig uh, and it's like unlimited phone and text messages. So. You could save a lot of money by using it. I've recently switched. Okay, that's it. Back to the site. Okay, so this site is written in Angular. Um, it is a marketing promo site, and I love doing random performance tests of different sites that Comcast develops. Uh, there are 4,000 engineers in the Philadelphia office. I do not know all the people who work on this. I don't know all the engineers there. Um, frankly, like, like this is a slow, slow site. So I, I just ran a performance test on this, and I was like, you know, you figure it would be fast because they're selling mobile phones, and it's a mobile responsive site. And that took over 30 seconds to run a performance test on that, or to load the site on a mobile phone. And most people, after three seconds, would just leave. So nobody's actually going to the site in mobile. Uh, but the way you do this is if you open up the Chrome Developer Tools, you can actually simulate a uh, network speed of 3G and a CPU slowdown is 6x. So that's like the advanced tab. There's like a little uh, cog up in the top right that you can click on, which will expand and give you that option. And I think the important thing to note here is that programmers know the benefits of everything and the trade-offs of nothing. So this is Rich Hickey. He's the father of Clojure, from, right? And he gave this talk, Simplicity Matters, where he talks about in the Ruby on Rails world, or even in today with JavaScript, everybody does npm install some kind of module or hairball. And they're like, oh, that solves my problem. And that, that thing that you're loading could be like, oh, cool, another 100 kilobytes that you just send down to the browser with, 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 when you only need like a two kilobyte little function to do your thing that you need to do. So be very careful what you're NPM installing. Um, and also take into consideration the framework size that you're choosing and what your needs are. If you are developing a full desktop application that you need a lot of power, use Angular. Angular is great. It contains a lot of awesome tools that are available for it. If you are building a marketing demo site, don't use a framework. Don't use React. Don't use anything. Vanilla JavaScript HTML CSS works great. If you have a personal website, don't use React. You have no reason for it. Just like put your picture up there, put some text up there. Don't even have JavaScript on there. All right, that was my rant. <laughs> Uh, but the point here is like smaller framework size is better. So Adios Money has another article where a lot of major companies are switching from React to Preact. <laughs> and you're like, what's the difference between React and Preact? Right? One has a P in front, one doesn't. Preact is only three kilobytes in size. React is 35 kilobytes. By switching, they save 15% in startup time. And for every 1% or one second, you get 27% increase in money. That is a lot of money, a lot of money, especially with billion dollar companies. Heck of a lot of money. Um, but it's more than just your framework, right? As soon as you say, hey, I'm gonna go with React. Cool, you got your view. Then you need React Router. Then you're like, oh, I'm gonna throw in Redux too, because who doesn't do Redux nowadays? And then you need RxJS, because who doesn't want functional programming with their, their Redux layer? And by the time you get started writing any of your code, you already have 300 kilobytes of assets that you're sending down the browser to make all your magic happen. And I like to emphasize that your user does not care. When they go to your website, they care that it works and that they can use it and it's fast. That's, that's really what they care about. They don't look at the source code like I do and say, hey, is this, is this written in Angular or React or, or Polymer or Web Components? They don't care. They just care that it works. So make sure it works and make sure it's fast. And all this other stuff, like don't don't be a resume-driven developer where it's like, oh yeah, I use I use React and, and RxJS because all the cool kids are doing it nowadays. Um, and be very careful about what you're doing when you're including packages. So this is Webpack Analyzer. It will tell you all the files that you're adding into your bundle. 
Um, if you are importing Lodash and you're like, I just want to use one Lodash function. If you are not using the latest version of Webpack and importing it correctly, it will import the entire library and send down 526 kilobytes to your user. Don't do that. RxJS, I just, I just picked on this a little bit. Like, you like to write <laughs> functional code. That's great, your users don't care. That's 207 kilobytes for RxJS. Uh, another way to, to ask this is, like, will the benefits of using this package outweigh the performance costs to the users? Does it help you as a developer to write faster, cleaner code than it affects the startup performance of the site? Um, Webpack 4 does tree shaking. So if you use only certain functions in the Lodash library, it will only import those into your bundle, making for smaller bundle sizes. Summary, just, just use Webpack 4, okay? If you're still in Webpack 2, upgrade. Cool, good talk. Um, but the average website today is 410 kilobytes, is what they're shipping down, which is really slow. And this is why Alex Russell um, has this talk, Web Components, just in the nick of time. So I'm a big fan of the Google Polymer project and the Google Polymer team. And their motto is to use the platform. And the cool part is they work in the same building as the Google Chrome developers, so they can influence the platform. And the basic idea is, this is what we're doing today, is we're sending down a whole bunch of JavaScript and framework code, and what if the browser could do a lot more for you? What if the browser was your framework? And that's the core concept behind web components. Does anybody use web components yet? You or me, just, just the two of us. Just the two of us. Just the two of us. Um, so web components are four different specs, custom elements, templates, HTML imports, and shadow DOM. HTML imports is dead. Uh, We'll talk about that in a second. But custom elements gives you a very uh, similar structure to React components with lifecycle hooks. So you create a class, you have connected callback, disconnected, attribute change callback. Um, you can then say custom elements.define with the browser, uh, give it a tag name, and then anywhere the browser sees that, it will execute your class. Very similar to React, all being done in the browser, no polyfills, no 35 kilobyte overhead, boom, happy dance. Template tags, this is a performance optimization for you to take an array of JSON objects and quickly create markup in the DOM. Um, template tags parse the HTML markup inside of there once, and you can clone it very quickly without the browser having to parse it every single time. You will probably never use this, but your frameworks will. So just, just forget everything, this will not be on the test. I like this, this is, this is good talking at a college. I can have all kinds of <laughs> teacher jokes. HTML imports are not around anymore, but this is a great way to import HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Um, right now, we only import JavaScript or CSS separately, but this would allow you to include it all in one file. Uh, and then lastly is the Shadow DOM. This is definitely the most powerful one. This allows for you to have an encapsulation of your components. So you can create a component which has CSS customized for it, and I like to say it's kind of like Hotel California. What checks in doesn't check out. So you can write CSS, uh, and you can put like a, a wild card and say everything should be red, and that will only affect that component. It won't affect the rest of the page. The other benefit of web components is they're closer to the metal. These new APIs exist in all mobile phones today. So you've had these APIs for almost a year now. So you pay no performance overhead by shipping your website with web components. And that's kind of why we chose Polymer. Uh, and we build our site with web components. So if you are interested in building a website with Polymer or web components, you can check out Kevin's talk, End to End Apps with Polymer. This is really great. Uh, and now I'm gonna talk about some of the architecture patterns for building a progressive web app, and a single page app in general. Uh, so one of the terms that they came up with is this purple pattern. And the purple pattern stands for push, render, pre-cache, and lazy load. And what this means is, you want to have your initial JavaScript and bundle sent down so that you're pushing down exactly what the client needs to render that initial screen. You want to render and be interactive as quickly as possible. And, and that's what's happening here is this is where they're interactive, that first render in 1.75 seconds. And then you'll notice afterwards they're lazy loading additional pages and additional segments and bundles. Um, and that way it slowly stays interactive, it slowly loads additional JavaScript that the user needs to navigate the rest of the site. 
but exactly what the user needs, they have instantly. And this is done via code splitting. So Webpack 4 has this built in now. You can actually have different entry points in your, your Webpack bundle, and it will generate different JavaScript bundles for you. The other thing they talk about is this app shell architecture. When you are building a single page app, you want to follow this pattern, which is you have your index page, and then you have your shell, which, which is basically your Chrome for your site. So here it is visually. Um, this is the stuff that should not change between releases. Your framework, your outer page, your navigation at the top, your navigation at the bottom. Your content changes with every release. But this, you can cache with your users for 30 days, 60 days, uh, and that will load, that will stay on the browser, and then you're just loading in these small fragments for the overview page, or the people page, or whatever other pages you have. Does that make sense? I think everybody's with that? Cool. And this is good. Like This is, this is good patterns. But I, I really like performance, so I like to do better. Uh, the thing that you have to take into consideration is the startup of your application and how you actually render. So a common pattern is you have your top level component and then you put all your logic inside of your, your application, your framework. And the problem with this approach is your components and framework take a while to start up. Like if you're doing this in Angular, Angular has to start up and initialize its framework before it starts doing anything that you want it to do. And for us, our critical path to get something to the user is we need to authenticate the user, and then we need to start making API calls, and then we want to load the view. And the reason why we want to make API calls is getting the devices for a user takes about three seconds, right? We might have to go all the way into their house to get what devices are available on their network. So what we do is we pull out the authentication and data, and we do that as just JavaScript. It's not dependent on a framework. It's not dependent on a library. We put that as the top thing in the index page that they're loading. So that will be called first, and then after that we load any polyfills that we might need, we load our Polymer library framework, whatever you want to call it, and then we start loading our application logic, our view logic after that. And after the application then loads up and we load the initial application, we then prefetch the remaining fragments, all the different pages. So, how do we do with the performance of our site? We're doing pretty well on time too, we got about 15 minutes. Um, so when I first started this, I did a performance recording. It took about six seconds for our application to load on desktop. I'm going I'm to do full pause there. So if you would do this on a mobile phone, it would be about 30 seconds to start up, uh, which, is, which is sad, right? It's like, like that extending mobile. Uh, and the first thing that I noticed in this top, this purple in a, in a performance tool is rendering. That is CSS calculations and rendering something on the screen. That was taking 1.7 seconds. That should never, ever, 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 ever take more than 100 milliseconds. Um, so this was a major issue that I, 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 I spent a lot of time figuring out. And I like to say sometimes tackling performance issues is like finding a four-leaf clover. Uh, you have to spend a lot of time looking, and you have to really get lucky and have your, your rabbit's foot there, and you have to have a friend who's slower than you running out, out on the bear. It's about getting lucky a lot of times. Uh, Programming is a lot like that too. Like you could spend 12 hours and and finally get to the point where you wrote five lines of code and you're like, yes, I totally fixed it and got it working. Everybody knows that feeling. Um, but yeah, this was a, a bug in Chrome that I found. We were using this new thing called CSS properties. Ever, has anybody heard of these? These allow you to find variables in your CSS code. And this works natively in the browser. So here we can actually set a variable brown. And then anywhere in our code, we can say var, we can reference that, that variable and just use it. And the problem was that all of our variables were on HTML and Brute. Brute is this new pseudo selector, which is like the top level document. And I moved one of the properties and just added one custom property on the body tag. And it dropped recalculation of styles from 500 milliseconds to 64 milliseconds. And that property was just a blank property. It had absolutely no effect. But I think it like invalidated the, the Chrome cache or something. Uh, and totally fixed rendering. Um, but it's really important, like, if you want your site to render fast, this is what Chrome puts out as the recommendation. You want less than 1,500 nodes, uh, maximum depth, which is like HTML, body, H1 tag, div tags, like the depth, 32 nodes, and no parent should have more than 60 children. Another corny joke, I have two children, that is plenty of children. 
my wife came with family. She has five children. Her, her parents had like 12 or 13 siblings. I'm like, no, no, that's awful. Uh, anyway, one of the ways that you solve the depth problem is this is the people profile page. So you would have the people page, which would list all your people, and then you have a subchild of that. And normally how you would do this is you would have your HTML code like this, where you have your app and your router and then people page, and then this would be a sub page in your people page. Don't do that. Anytime you have a full level page, put it at the top level in your router. So your router could have 50 top level pages. They could be nested however they need to be nested from a UX perspective, but keep them top level because they will render faster because the CSS doesn't have to calculate all the way up the DOM. I don't, I don't have time to go into how CSS calculates. You can, you can ask me afterwards if you want. Uh, next thing that's really cool that I found out while doing this is API requests. So, like I said, it takes about three seconds for us to get all the network information that we want. And during that time, we actually weren't processing any JavaScript during the one or two seconds downtime while we were waiting. Uh, and that's a big problem. So you want to optimize when you first start making network requests. So get that first initial call. This is our initial call to our API layer. Try to get that as early up in your, your index page as possible. Even if you have to do like loading, body tag, script tag, make API call. Like that's the best way to speed that up as quickly as possible. But you want to start making calls as quickly as possible. Um, you can give hints to the browser. So this is DNS prefetch, uh, which tells it, hey, we actually make cross-origin calls. Uh, so we do a DNS prefetch to say this is the origin that we're going to be calling. And Chrome will automatically do a DNS request that saves about 50 milliseconds. Um, but the important thing that I learned is when you're making a network request, so this very beginning is like how long it took for the browser to actually contact the server. This is how long it took for the server to respond to this gray bar. And this long line here, this is when the JavaScript thread actually processed the response, which is 400 milliseconds later. And the reason for that is the main thread was busy loading up our framework and doing all kinds of other stuff. So even though we were prioritizing making API calls, we weren't actually handling the responses for 400 milliseconds later because we were loading up our framework. So it's very important to like delay loading up your framework or whatever else you need to do the critical API calls that you have to do. So I found that interesting. Uh, another thing is like we finished making API calls here. And then we initialized a whole bunch of components after the network was done. And it was like, cool, we just wasted another 200 milliseconds doing stuff that could have been done, could have been done over here, which we probably should have done. Um, OK, cool things to optimize for. So we use splash loaders. I won't ask how many people work on applications with splash loaders, mostly because there's probably a lot of college kids in here. Um, but if you have a splash loader, don't put your loader inside of your framework. So here, when we were showing it, we have a whole bunch of JavaScript loading here. And it took about a second for us to start showing a splash on desktop, which is a really long time. And the point is, you don't want your loader inside of React and Angular. You want that to be part of your base HTML CSS page. By doing so, by pulling it out and putting it right in the HTML markup as you know, just vanilla HTML CSS, the stuff that just works in the browser, that actually renders in 0.2 seconds. It's almost instantaneous that the user gets something on the screen. And that's a much better experience. And the way that you do this is any JavaScript that you have on your site, put a defer tag on there. Put it in the head of your document and put defer. And the browser will actually start downloading them and it will continue rendering the page. And in a separate thread, it actually processes these and then parses them in the same order that they appeared in the DOM. This is just a great optimization. Use the defer tag. Uh, another thing to note is we have the splash screen up here this entire time, and there's all these purple mounds. So the browser's doing a lot of rendering. And a lot of times when you, when you put up a splash loader, you just z-index it over top of everything else. And all the other divs and h1 tags are still underneath, and the browser is still rendering them, because they're all still visible. What you want to do is, if you have a loading splash up, just display none everything else. And that way the browser doesn't have to spend any processing time rendering these things. So, so literally what was happening was like the API was responding and all this stuff was like calculating and rendering and rendering and re-rendering and it's like, well, we don't need any of it to render. Uh, recalculation of styles. So every time you see a purple mountain, that is the browser recalculating styles. You're injecting new style sheets, new CSS, 
And this happens if you load multiple bundles, which each have individual CSS in it. Um, and anywhere in your JavaScript, you can make certain calls, which will force a recalculation of styles. And if you click on any purple bar that's red, it will pull up the Chrome tools and it will tell you exactly what line caused a recalculation of styles. And there is a, a gist by Paul Irish, which says all the things that causes a recalculation. And this is essentially anytime you ask something, where are you at in the DOM? What is your width and height? What is your offset? If you ask any of those things, the browser immediately has to calculate where that item is on the screen. Uh, and for instance, we were actually focusing an element, which requires knowing where it is, and that caused a recalculation of styles, which locks up the main thread for 100, 200 milliseconds. Um, so here's more instances of it. I'm trying to move fast because we have five minutes left, which might be enough time. Um, so here's an instance where we were using a, a third party package uh, to do dialog boxes. And inside of that library that we were using, it had this code of get computed style, which that basically asks for what's the width and height of this element. And I, I love the memoirs up here. Memorization is basically a technique that says, if you have a really expensive calculation, do it, and then cache the results of it. Unfortunately, they were, they were caching the results on each instance of the modal window, and we were loading this thing 27 times. So 27 times it was, it was doing that calculation, uh, and that like, there was so much jank from that. Like every time you could imagine just like boom, boom, boom. Um, yeah, so after you optimize the startup of your site, you want to start then looking at switching tabs and switching between pages. And you can do that just by clicking the record button, clicking on something in the JavaScript, and then clicking stop recording, and it will tell you everything that happened um, during those two steps. So switching from the overview page to our network page was taking 1.2 seconds, and you can see that huge amount of JavaScript that was happening up there. And the reason for that was we were actually loading too much. So we were lazily initializing additional components for that next page. And the problem was like, this is the page here, and there's like five or six sub pages, and we were initializing all those sub pages too. The key point here is do only what the user needs to see that one screen. Lazy and defer everything that you can to slowly load that after the fact. Um, because JavaScript, JavaScript, job, bleh, it's getting near the end. JavaScript is expensive. Um, so after you optimize for those things, you want to look for slow functions. So here we were actually using uh, Moment.js, which is a library for doing date calculations. And you would think this is like a very simple function where you're just taking in a date and you're calling moment and then diffing them. Um, if you can spot the difference between this, this one's using moment, this is using date operator, which is built in the browser. There is a 45 millisecond difference between those two functions. Just because one is using a library which then has like 50 calls underneath of it um, versus that. So be careful which libraries you're using and why you're using them. Ultimately, got the site down to about 2.3 seconds, which was great. We pushed it out to production. It dropped the average load time for all devices from 21 seconds down to 15 seconds. Uh, there was additional performance improvements after that release. I like to recommend that if you want to actually check performance on a mobile phone, you can tether your phone to your laptop and run the Chrome developer tools against a phone. Uh, so I have the steps and knowledge on how to do it with the links. Um, but it's really great because it actually profiles on that phone. So get a real phone and actually run tests on a phone to know how fast it, are, how fast it is. So in summary, whew, we are about done. And I still have two minutes, which is how long it takes for me to go do the summary. Um, 37 Signals has this great quote, solving 80% of the original problem for 20% of the effort is a major win. The original problem is almost never so bad that it's worth five times the effort to solve it. Uh, so 37 Signals is the creators of Ruby on Rails. Well, Ruby on Rails. Uh, and I love this quote because what they're basically saying is, you know, your product owners are going to come with you and they're going to say, we need this new feature. And we need this feature. And only 1% of your users are going to use it and it's going to add two seconds onto your startup time. And that's, that's when you need to push back and say, is this feature really worth it? Does it help enough users to offset the cost of the performance of the startup on our site? And that's really what you want to ask. Also, making a site really fast requires a tremendous amount of discipline. As Pinterest says, they have 600 JavaScript files. 
one ill-chosen import like Lodash bloats your bundle. And it's really hard to maintain performance, especially across a large team. I highly recommend that you have a lot of automated tools, your continuous integration environment, doing Webpack. Webpack actually has um, a line in there that you can get a warning if your bundle size goes over 200 kilobytes or whatever, whatever max size you want to say. But it is really, really hard. It requires a lot of discipline. A lot of discipline. But there's a tremendous amount of benefits. In that same Pinterest article, um, one year after releasing their PWA, they have this great quote, which is less than six months since fully shipping, they have 800,000 weekly users using their PWA like a native app. Uh, so definitely a lot of benefits to it. If you like this talk, I have other talks up on, online. I also stream on Twitch, and I will answer any random web development questions that you might have. So feel free to check out my schedule on there. Slides are available. I will tweet them out afterwards. I am at Chief CLL. And if there's any questions, we have a minute or two to. And then this, this talk is recorded. That was a ton of information. Thank you all for your time.